Greetings and salutations, everyone. It's time for another episode of Viewport Relay, a bi-weekly podcast where the Viewport team looks at the latest news in the gaming industry. I'm your host, Albert Corston, and I'm joined, as always, by Tristan Jung and Alex Nestor. Tristan, you should have should have completed that Captain Toad. I like it. I like it. Pretty pretty excited for some games coming out in July, aren't we, right, guys? Ah, uh, so hype. Incredibly excited. Incredibly excited. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Wait, do, do you hear that? It's it's coming from somewhere. Uh, oh, mm-hmm. oh it, it's a randomly appearing segment. What what are you guys playing? What have you guys been playing? Oh, I see. Oh. I, I was not prepared for this, even if you told me this last night. I've been playing... Some League of Legends, I think. Oh no! Mm. I I've been playing a little League of Legends, a little bit of StarCraft Two, playing some Tower Defense, playing some uh, hit the customs. Yeah, hit the customs real hard. Play some ARAM. Ooh, they have a. Oh, I thought you were talking about StarCraft. Still, I was like, wait, how does that work? But yeah, that's that's what I've been up to. So uh, all of last week, I played through uh, Shining Resonance Refrain. There you go. It was uh, an interesting journey. It was pretty grindy. I felt it was pretty dang average, but, you know, can't beat them all. What do you and know was... about JRPGs? Yeah, I know. I, I'm a fake of the JRPG genre. I I can't love it, but... Spoiler alert, check out his review if you haven't on viewportgaming.com. I did write up a review for it, and yeah, it's just a very average JRPG. I'm looking forward to some other games coming out later, like Yakuza. I, I thought you were going to say, I'm just looking forward to playing other games. No. Yep, maybe. Uh, and then also, I've been trying to get into uh, Just Cause 3, which has been oh. fun so far. It's pretty mindless. You just shoot stuff and blow things up. Pretty good. Tristan, Tristan were you, were you thinking he was going to say, I'm trying to get into Boat Girls? Well, that's just a given. I play that all the time. It's oh, you don't even bring it up anymore. It's yeah, it's not, it's even, it's worth not even a it. surprise that I'm playing Azure Lane. So you know, just throw it away. Okay. When's the Azure Lane sponsorship? I I don't know. Whenever the English release contacts me to do some uh, advertisement, I'll do it. All right. Uh, as for me, I've been playing some some Prey at Steam sale. You know, I got the Dishonored Two Prey bundle. And Prey is a very scary game, but I torture myself, I guess, and play it. Tristan didn't like it at all. I played it for about four hours, and I was like, this is very not comfortable. It's like playing Resident Evil 7 again, so I just kind of turned it off and never went back. But you get a glue gun. You do get a glue gun. Spelled G-L-O-O. It's it's the coolest gun in the game, I think. And it's, it's a really cool mechanic. I like it. All right, what's that? We're I'm getting I'm getting news that we're we're getting a signal from our from our correspondent Tristan Jung in the field on some of our viewers and their anticipated games for July. Hello, my name is Tristan Jung, Twitter correspondent. This episode, we asked our viewers, "It's already July. Which July release are you looking forward to the most?" And uh, surprisingly, unsurprisingly. We had Octopath Traveler coming on top with 60% of the votes. Albert, are you excited for Octopath? Good selection. Good selection. That is going to be... I'm a real JRPG fan, unlike unlike Alex. (laughs) Oh my god. So, obviously... 9 out of 10, automatically. uh, 9 out of 10 game already, right there. You know, screw the the text. I'll just upload an article. It just says 9 out of 10. We'll call it a day. 9 out of 10. Yep. Put it. Just drop it. Wednesday, right? That's when the review embargo drops, right? Just yeah, I'll just I'll just post one up. Just just post one up. Mm-hmm. All right, what what else we got on that list, Tristan? We had Shining Resonance with ten percent. There we go. The Banner Saga three with fourteen percent. Whoa, Banner Saga! Whoa, some indie love going on right there. At Angry Tacos said No Man's Sky on Xbox. Hmm. I can't tell if that's if that's a joke. Bold Isn't that choice. game already out on Xbox? No, it's coming out in in uh, on Xbox in July. It, it hasn't been oh. released yet. Oh, they were okay. waiting for the game to be completed first. 
Yeah, I I have heard it's a lot better now. So we'll we'll have to see how that goes. If you look at like the on Steam where it shows you the recent essentially the recent ratings and how it's doing, I think it's actually like positive. That's that's what it's called. It's like overwhelmingly positive, positive, mediocre, or average or whatever. Mixed. Or mixed mixed mm-hmm. mixed. Yeah. I think it's positive. So, it's definitely on the upturn. And at 3 underscore Stan said Captain Toad Treasure right, Tracker. All right, that's some right. bias. Boop, oh, no. <laughs> oh no! That'll be that'll just be your play out. Thanks, thanks for the report, Twitter correspondent Tristan. It's almost Jungle. sounding like a Star Fox on the end of that. There, I don't know. Uh-huh, could be Miyamoto might come out anywhere. <laughs> Watch out! But yes, I've been Tristan Jung, Twitter correspondent. Back to you guys at the studio. Thank you, Tristan. We'll, we'll check in back with you later on on the sports. Um, but right now we have an update to a story from I think it was a month ago, month and a half ago. Um, we can't we can't not talk about Fortnite, right, guys? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the only reason this podcast exists at this point. Premier Fortnite news right here. We're, right, we're Fortnite news network right now. FNN. Anyways, um, PUBG sued Fortnite. Uh, I think it was in May, regarding essentially stealing a bunch of the game ideas and copyright infringements and intellectual property breaches and all that jazz. But they have dropped the lawsuit. And, I mean, guys, we pretty much said two months ago when this came out that this lawsuit was not going to go well for them if they went through with it. Yeah, they didn't really have any legs to stand on, I don't think. And this was like, it must have just been a publicity thing. I can only think of to like get more attention to their update that they're coming out with. We did bring up the fact that PUBG uses Unreal Engine, which mm-hmm. Epic Games makes. So I assume Epic Games lawyer found something, their lawyers found something in their contract that essentially said, "Hey, if you don't drop this lawsuit, we're not going to let you use our engine because you're in violation of such and such potentially." Also, as Alex said, they probably didn't have any grand to st- ground to stand on at all. All right, but now into some fresh news. We've got a lot of heat. Uh, first story comes from a game dev community of Guild Wars 2. Uh, not a stranger to sometimes generating some controversy, but essentially one of the writers for Guild Wars 2 was posting essentially why and how to write, or why it's difficult to write NPC characters in an MMO. Um, and just to quickly, really briefly summarize, they essentially said, oh, because the player character needs to essentially develop their own identity, so you can't hard code in a story for them to follow, which is why it's not the same as a single player game. Um, and someone responded to her tweet in which she essentially took it very badly and sort of, I don't know if berated is a strong word, but pulled the gender card, said that they didn't know what they were doing called them some no-name fan or whatever, when in reality it was actually um, a streamer who actually has supported Guild Wars 2 for a long time, and has streamed Guild Wars 2 for a long time, and essentially ArenaNet, there was a huge uproar, and ArenaNet, the creators of Guild Wars 2, um, fired that employee, as well as another employee who was talking in the comments, um, essentially having a flame war in the Twitter comments. But uh, I guess first things first, what do you guys think of Arena Neff's response to this issue? So, this is... Uh, Alex and I were talking about this before we started recording. This is a very... I gotta... We gotta word things properly here. Uh, I feel like at the beginning, I was like, mm, I don't know if you want to be talking like that. And then Arena Net did their firing, and I was like, oh man, what's going on? And then it just kind of kept getting worse and worse. I don't want to sound like I'm taking sides, but I just I just want everyone to be nice to each other. How about that? Let's <laughs> that's my conclusion. That's the internet man though. It's I don't I don't know if that's gonna happen. But I mean do you think the guy was being rude at all? Do you I think it's I think I don't want to speak for anyone, but we're all in agreement that she she originally probably handled the encounter in the encounter not as gracefully as she could have. Right. Probably, yeah. 
I I haven't listened to the full statement or read the full statement that the uh, streamer did put out, but from the sounds of it, it really wasn't all that inflammatory towards her or like criticizing her ability to do things. It was just rather kind of an idea that he had to present and give to her. So I I don't know. It felt kind of very uh, jumping the gun by her. But so Alex, what do you think of Arena Nets' response? Too far, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure they should have just straight up fired her. They gave, of course, a very strong PR message afterwards. They don't really want their uh, developers and creators uh, personally attacking uh, their player base, which is understandable. You don't want basically demonize your player base. It forces them away. But... uh at the same time, yeah, it does definitely seem pretty rash by the company to just instantly fire these two people the day after it happens. I, I think the worst kind of realization that came out of this is that there was a post on Reddit that basically said, now we can control who works at ArenaNet. Like, we, if somebody steps out of line, we can just get them fired by posting some thread. I think that's the worst part. Um, I mean, each company has their own policies and maybe, you know, it's all subjective, but the fact that Reddit now has this mentality, I think that's the unhealthy part that came out of, uh, the situation. I think that that is a bad mentality, but I, I, I half think that comment's a joke when I think about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that obviously that's not true. And just in terms of like, we have the power to fire anyone. I'm sure if you were to... I'm sure if someone at any of the workplaces you work at were to, or like even just a big uh, company with that has a product or something, and you were a outspoken employee and just started berating people who like the product on Twitter, I'm I'm not sure if you get fired, but you'd definitely be reprimanded at work. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if this is unique to just the game industry. It's more of just PR right. to control damage. One of the big things that ArenaNet's uh, PR message did put out is that if you are facing harassment, they want you to go to the company, not just instantly start attacking the person yourself on some social media platform. So a company-wide message could have been released instead, you know, be a little kinder to each other. I don't know how inflammatory the streamer got or anything else that was said to her, but something must have provoked her, but yeah. I'll preface with this before I ask my next question, but I definitely think that game devs have it a lot worse than other companies online in terms of the amount of, you could call it feedback, putting it nicely, that their fans sometimes give their game. Not saying that in this case the fan was rude in any way. I did read the the original tweet he responded with. It, was, it wasn't rude or trying to make fun of her or how her job or even her being female in the industry at all, but... um I guess my question is, if game devs or any person, for that matter, post things online, should they be sort of ready for criticism? Or should they just take it to a platform that doesn't allow the two-way discussion just to be able to state their opinions without having immediate uh, feedback slash criticism by others? Yeah, I, I know a lot of people do that. I think the most direct example would be like a YouTube video series that doesn't allow comments. That's... <laughs> Basically the gist of that, I think. So maybe that'd be the way to go about it. But at the same time, it kind of allows a very casual conversation with fans, both positive and negative, I think. And it's just really a matter of how hard you take it, I guess. So obviously a lot of people can be pretty shitty in terms of how they treat you, but you just have to kind of take it in stride. And of course, there's always the ignore button if you really need to, so... No need to really make a personal fight out of things, I don't think. That's true. Just block and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all these people who are in these like prominent positions should be aware that what they say in public could be used against them, right? Like, if a CEO right. tweets out something ridiculous, that's going to affect their company or their job. So, I mean, at, at this point... Um, where social media is so, you know, prominent, things like that, I think it's kind of on the individual to kind of make the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this, this event did happen on the 4th of July, so technically she was off duty, but you still act in some capacity as your company's voice 
I think, on a social media platform at this point. Yeah, if if you worked at Company X and you tweeted out some, like, real racist stuff, I'm sure that can be used against you. Yeah, I imagine you'll get a message from HR pretty quick. Okay, so our next story is Todd Howard doing an interview on some of the things of Bethesda, and he came out and said that Fallout 76's online multiplayer does not mark the future of Bethesda titles. Um, this is just, I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on just, have you guys ever, like, over time, looked forward to playing an online version of a Bethesda game? Like, have you wished, I wish the Ace game was online. I, I kind of dabbled with the idea i think that it'd be really silly to play an elder scrolls title like morrowind or something as multiplayer which uh i think technically now you can do but uh yeah i think it would be a lot of fun just to mess around a few times i don't think i'd do it very long but it'd be something worth doing and uh it'd probably be really cool if you're in like a role play community what are your guys' hype levels at for uh fallout 76 uh, currently fairly low. Uh, admittedly, I didn't really like the atmosphere or the s- gameplay of Fallout 4 very much, and this game's looking much like an expansion of that, just in a different uh, part of the country. So I'm currently not excited for it. I- I'm pretty packing. I've I've loved Fallout. I think the idea of a co-op or competitive online, you know, Fallout is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And I am pretty excited to try it out. And I mean, going back to the article, I think this is a great mentality for Bethesda to take. I know they haven't really been accused of like doing the same things over and over again, per se, as much as other companies like Activision. But Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea that they're willing to try out crazy things. And I think a lot of other companies should follow this. They've stuck pretty close to their guns the past couple of releases, I would say. Uh, at least uh, Bethesda Game Studios, maybe not including, like... So, segueing into this, and what Todd has said, although we don't know a lot about their upcoming title, Starfield, I think that's a perfect game for a multiplayer version of a space sim. Sort of kind of like, you know, that Star Citizen game, if that game ever comes out. No Man's Sky? Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, but I do think that this sort of, that space genre, especially if they're, we don't know if they're, if you can fly ships around or what's going on with that. But do you guys think that they're eyeing the success of what Fallout 76 does? And if it does, if it's the best selling, if it sells more than Skyrim, do you think Todd sort of bites his words and goes back and says, Hey, we're going to replicate this multiplayer because it's it's selling well. Well, uh, I I think of course if it sells extremely well, they'll replicate this idea as much as they can into some other games. Now, will they implement it in every game? I don't think so. Probably not. Just considering uh, their track record for what games they have come out with. Uh, but man, I'm still terrified of what a Bethesda online multiplayer game is going to play like. How buggy is this game going to be? I think they're going to stick to their guns on what they want Starfield to be. From the mm-hmm. interviews I've read, it sounds like they want to try something drastically different because they've been kind of bound down by what Elder Scrolls is like, what Fallout is like. So I don't see them trying, like, I don't see them incorporating these older features into the game just because it works. If, if they just make Starfield like Mass Effect... I will I will be happy. Yeah, that'd be pretty interesting if they tried their hand at like a fully third person game or something like that. Yep. Alrighty guys. Moving on. Not much discussion on these, but we got some we got some feel good stories, alright? So first of all we had Summer Games two th- Summer Games Done Quick two thousand eighteen ending, and it raised two point one two million dollars for Doctors Without Borders. Always, always love that event. And then just another quick headline. We've got the, there was that Pink Mercy skin that was raising money for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And it raised $12.7 million, which is crazy. It's a bit of pocket change. That's more than SGDQ. That's more than some game sell. 
how long were they selling it selling that skin i recall it was one let me look i want to say it was only one or two months okay it was two weeks oh, two weeks that's insane no way it was yeah. two weeks damn impressive sgdq has gotta step up their game <laughs> It's gotta start selling they, mercy skins. They, they need more waifus at their event. That's why. Exactly. All right. So that was just some some quick feel good stories. You know, gaming community coming together, helping out, helping out the world. Um, but coming right off that, we're getting we're getting into some hot topic right here, and we're talking about Sony crossplay, and Sean Layden's response essentially to all the criticism that they've been getting. And there's not much news in terms of what they're doing, but we do. I just want to talk about the quote. And essentially he said, quote, I'm confident we'll get to a solution which will be understood and accepted by our gaming community. I'm just going to ask right now, do you even buy this response? Is he just is he just waiting for this all to blow over? Yeah, I think that's good business talk for we're not going to do anything. Yeah, once the gaming community gives up, then it's understood and accepted. You think it's just, I mean, I, we talked about it last podcast, so I don't want to hearken on it too much, or hark, not hearken, hark on it too much, but if Fortnite doesn't get them to do it, and Todd Howard, right, he said that uh, Fallout 76 will not have crossplay due to Sony, um, if none of those games can generate enough buzz, I mean, Sony can just sit there and twiddle their thumbs, I assume, right? Twiddle their thumbs and their piles of cash all right very quick hot topic i guess that was just sony sony being a little little stingy still sticking to their guns this has been going on for a while i don't see why there's any reason for them to change if like you said if fortnite doesn't change their mind then i don't see anything else that will unless like kojima's like oh death stranding has to be crossplay for some reason yeah you got to play it on your UPS delivery device or something, you know, cross play on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My PlayStation Vita. Yeah. I was thinking maybe the one thing that they would change was there was that thing where you need to have a completely new account if you want to play on Sony. Fortnite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So they might loosen up on that on the account restrictions so people don't lose progress between cross play, but just they still can't play together. So we've got a little rumor coming up in our next story, and that's Turtle Rock Studios, famous for their being, for helping Valve create, and I guess not helping, but actually creating the Left 4 Dead series, is now working on an unannounced title in a, quote, globally known franchise. So we'll just get to the rumor. Is this Left 4 Dead 3, guys? No, it's Evolve 2. Evolve is globally known. I don't think... Left 4 Dead 3... Serious? Valve? Releasing a, a third game? That's not going to happen. I mean, we have had rumors in the past of Gabe saying that Valve is getting into sort of pumping out game releases. And over the past, what, I want to say three or four years now, every time Valve has like a Dev Days conference, they've been supposed showing Left 4 Dead 3 footage or models or Source Engine 2 running Left 4 Dead 3. Do you, I mean, it's not... Highly unlikely? I don't know. Alex, what do you think? My hot take? Team Fortress 3. (laughs) Oh, no. There's just not enough room for hats anymore in TF2. We need a third. We need Source 2. We need Source 3. Mm -hmm. We're adding hat physics. Yep. The unusual effects aren't enough anymore. We We need the next engine. I thought... Valve said that they're working on single player experiences. Isn't that what they said? That is true. That mm-hmm. you did correct me. Yes, that specifically is what they actually said. Here we go. Here's my hot take. Turtle Rock got acquired by Konami. They're working on the next Metal Gear Survive. Metal oh. Gear Survive 2. Uh, oh no. Globally no. Co-op and a shooter. Done. Mhm. Maybe some pachinko thrown in there. I like it. Oh wait, we're, we're we're wrapping up. Here's our last news story today. We have a game today. I should have prefaced at the beginning. We have another game today, um, but we had Reggie coming off a, uh, I don't know how to put it, a 
interesting, I guess, Nintendo Direct at E3. Many people were left disappointed. Some people were saying people got their expectations too high. They should have expected this. Um, but Reggie, sort of trying to stoke the fire the past week, has been constantly saying we have more to release. We don't like to release everything at E3. Um, but he talked um, about some of the future things they're doing. And one of the questions that someone asked was about the N64 Classic. And he brushed off a little saying, oh, we know people love our classic games, but let me tell you about this SNES Classic we've got going on. Um, but I'm just going to ask you guys right now, are, are they working on N64 Classic? Do you think that they're not going to pass this opportunity up? Or do you think that the controller and they think that they could sell more doing some sort of virtual console thing? I think they're at some inflection point. Eventually, the consumer base is going to get real tired of this stuff. You don't want, like, four classic consoles just from Nintendo. I feel like they should kind of chillax for a little bit. Maybe keep selling their NES and SNES. Not worry about N64. Maybe for a year or two. Um... I don't see any reason for them to rush into this right now. You know, it would be a challenge to even make a collection of good N64 games. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that because it's such a limited library. Like, I think most of them would be all Nintendo games, and then some rare games. Uh, if they can even put rare games on there, I don't know if they could. I think they could, they could probably do Donkey Kong 64. I think that's as far as they could get. Could they, could they even get that? Do they have the licenses to that still? Uh, yeah, they released DK64 on Virtual Console. Okay. I mean, they own Donkey Kong. Yeah. I mean, speaking of good N64 games, though, I, I, I think we're getting a special news bulletin from Twitter correspondent Tristan Jung about the recent, not the recent, but it was over the past two weeks, Banjo Kazooie's 20th anniversary, and we asked, uh, I'll let, you know what? Screw this. Tristan, take it away, man. Hi. It's your Twitter correspondent, Tristan Jung. We asked our viewers and listeners, Banjo-Kazooie turns 20 years old today. What's your favorite game in the series? We've had 144 votes, and a majority, 57%, said Banjo-Kazooie. 30% said Banjo-Tooie. Oh, no, I feel so bad for the rest of this percent. <laughs> 8% said nuts and bolts, which I was really confused about. The, the strong few. Those are the people who haven't played the other ones, I hope. And 5% said other. What was the other? Like uh, Gruntilda's Revenge for GBA or something? That was a game? D Diddy Kong Racing? Diddy Kong Racing, yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite banjo game. We uh, we liked at Calvin Colton 6's response, who said, Conker's Bad Fur Day. Ah, yes, of course. There's always one of them. There's always one of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Tristan Jung. Uh, we will be checking in with you very shortly here on another potential special news bulletin. But before that, uh, going back to Reggie's interview, he uh, one of the questions was on Amiibo and sort of Nintendo strategy. And my question for you guys is that although Amiibo aren't necessarily new, um, we are seeing games like Starlink Battle for Atlas coming out with sort of this Toys for Life genre. And there's also been Skylanders, right, that has Toys for Life or Toys to Life, not Toys for Life. <laughs> toys for um, Life. So what, toys for <laughs> Life. I can't live without my toys. Anyways, what do you, what do you guys think of the Toys uh, to Life concept? Is it a cash grab? Is it an interesting game mechanic that actually sort of is... A viable thing that games can do to make their games fun or is it a little bit of both well mostly just for cash i think it's almost always a gimmick just a way to get people to pay money for dlc characters basically and then it's like a low quality figure i think it depends on who does it right like nintendo's amiibos are so popular because they literally own the hardware and publish the software. Whereas for Starlink, they only have control over one game. So if players don't play that game, it's really hard to sell them what toys, what toys in life, toys to life, toys, toys to, to life, life. hardware. You can call it toys for life if you want. <laughs> toys for life hardware. So I think it really depends on the position you're in. Right. 
Yeah, because some games have tried this as well. Like the Lego series had a kind of a toys to life game where you'd buy, for lack of a better word, Lego sets that were extremely basic, but you could basically uh, teleport them into the game and just play around with them. But that game kind of, I think, died. And I don't think they even make new uh, sets for them. So definitely can fail for certain companies if their game doesn't continue to get played. Right, and uh, Amiibos are even, like, cross-generation. You can use them on Wii U's, you can use them on the Switch. So, as long as you have, like, a very stable foundation where you can try this Mm -hmm. out, I think it's okay. Yeah, as long as they keep making features that people will like, and I guess as long as the figures are high-quality enough, and, of course, they're Nintendo characters, so people love them, they, they got a good thing going, I think. So I think the only people who can really pull this off are like the big publishers, you know, Sony, Microsoft. I mean, we got we got Funko Pop, you know, Gears of War, right? Mm-hmm. Can you use those with the game? No. Okay. No, those okay. Okay. I was really games. worried. I was like, Cliffy B somewhere crying. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What happened? Anyways. So with the Nintendo moving into Toys for Life, and this was multiple years ago, and Abibas aren't new. Um, but with the increasing statistics of VR, is VR a place that Nintendo might be wanting to go? Well, I mean, they've already been there. Let's not talk about the Virtual Boy here, guys. Let's not meme that up too much. But um, something that might, I guess you could say might be willing to retry in the future. I, I don't know. I think that may be the direction we're going in the industry is the VR. So I think it is something that Nintendo and maybe others will have to follow. I don't know if Nintendo will be first, probably not, given what they've done in the past. They're usually a couple generations behind. What, what do you mean first? Uh, first among the big three. I mean, PSVR already exists, right? So right. PlayStation's way ahead yeah, of that. They, they've already gotten ahead of the curve a little bit. Uh, primarily with, I think, Resident Evil 7 is one of the most popular VR titles for that system. Yeah, I hear Beat Saber is actually number one now on that. Oh, is it? Okay. Yep, and there's a uh, Tetris... Tetris Mania, Tetris Syndrome, something like that. Mm. Tetris Effect, that's what it's called, Tetris Effect. Yeah, so I I think Nintendo will follow suit no matter what, but yeah, matter of when, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, and Nintendo's already done some cool things with the 3DS with augmented reality. Um, Mm -hmm. But speaking of VR, we're getting that alluded to special news bulletin Taking out to the field to Tristan Jung. Oh god, I was not ready for this. News doesn't happen at your convenience, Twitter reporter Tristan Jung. Breaking story. It happens as life progresses. As Toys for Life progresses. Hi, I'm Twitter correspondent Tristan Jung again. We asked our listeners, VR users on Steam has increased 160% year over year. Do you own a VR headset? 14% said, yes, I use it regularly. 12% said, yes, but not too much. And 74% said, no. And we asked them to give us their reasons. At Terra Dicey and at Soraklamama both had the reason of it being way too expensive. Uh, Soraklamama said, I'm poor, but I want it. So freaking hard. And at Teradice, he said, it's too damn expensive. On the other hand, at Scaring Crows had more physical limitations. They said, it makes me dizzy after 10 minutes. Yeah, I've heard that for plenty of people. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yep. Motion sickness. At Old Ben 8 also had a response within that realm. They wear glasses, and it requires Mm -hmm. too much space to, uh, to use. Tristan... When we were at um, PAX a couple years ago and we played VR, uh, did you take off your glasses or did you wear them? Uh, There's enough room to keep my glasses on. Okay, that was an Oculus Rift too, right? Not a Vive? No, that was a PSVR. What? That was a PSVR. No, we played that that VR game up in the VR lounge. Oh, that was an Oculus. Yes, that was an Oculus. Did that have enough room as well? Yeah. We also had... One last response from at Calvin Colton Six, who said, "It's a nice invention, but it is too early for the year. It's expensive and in a in an alpha build state." 
I think this is very true. I, I, I want to go back to Nintendo for a little bit. I don't think Nintendo will release a VR headset until it is in a state where it's very easy to use. Like right now, you there's wires everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's hard to move around. It's heavy. I know that Oculus Go is kind of trying to resolve these issues, but it's definitely not at a state where it can power like a console gaming experience. So I think Nintendo is at least five to ten years out. Thank you to all our listeners for pitching in uh, their opinions and thoughts. That has been all for this episode's Twitter cor- Correspondent Report. I've been Tristan Jung. Back to you guys at the studio. All right. Thank you, Tristan. Um, if you want to appear on our Twitter Correspondent sections, just make sure to follow us on Twitter at Viewport Gaming and respond to our various questions and you might be featured. If you want to be featured. If you don't want to be featured, say you don't want to be featured. I don't know. Tristan, is there a way? No, never mind. Don't ask Tristan, me. is there a way they can't be featured? <laughs> There's no choice. You're being featured. <laughs> okay. Anyways, that concludes our news segment this time. We're moving into a game. Woo! A game. Are you guys ready for a game? Hell yeah. Give it to me. Oh, okay. You're so I'm, aggressive. I'm ready to win. You're so aggressive. Wait, who won last time? Tristan won the tiebreaker, right? He did, yeah. Yeah. All right, so it's 1-0 right now. This episode's game is called Best of the Bunch. Franchises are always a fun part of being a gamer, but in a franchise, there is always one game that stands above the rest. For this game, you're going to name the game in the franchise with the highest game ranking score. Game ranking or Metacritic? So game ranking because some of these are very close, and they had to go into decimals, and Metacritic does not go into decimals. So um, name the highest one, get a point, and then we'll just, we're actually, just because I wanted more points, because I think it's more fun. Who doesn't like points, right? Uh, we will do number two and number three as well. So it'll be top three, but um, yeah, highest three in the franchise, essentially. And you will, we won't, we'll not be buzzing in. There's no multiple choice this time. Um, you will be... You can, I will ask, the, I will say the franchise and you guys can talk it out together however you want to do. You can steal each other's answers, but obviously if someone, if you think the other person got it wrong, you can guess a different game or you can guess the same game, whatever you want to do. I will count points. I will wait till you both say an answer and then I will give you it and then we will move to the second game, and then the third game, so on in the next franchise. Um, just for rule wise to get this out of the way, um, I'm only counting the games with in the franchise that had five or more reviews. Some of them had just weird one review things that someone gave like 10 out of 10 and it has like a hundred. So, uh, it has to have five more reviews. All right. Are you guys ready? Do you understand the rules? Did sure. I make that more complicated than I needed you to? I, I got it. All right. So our first franchise is Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid. The high, best of the bunch. What was the number one highest rated game for Metal Gear Solid? MGS3. Mm-hmm. That's a really good choice. I'm almost fearful that it's going to be the Phantom Pain. But I'm going with Phantom Pain. You're both wrong. What? Oh, oh no. Oh, God. Is it actually going to be MGS4? The top game is MGS2, Sons of no. Liberty. Oh, wow. Really? So I'll give you guys a little hint here. For some of these games, that some of these series that are older... There were less reviews back when these games came out due to the game industry being smaller. So they might have a little inflated on the score. And they scored it out of one. So it's like zero out of one or one out of one. Zero. Still still pretty surprising, though, because uh, MGS2 polarized a lot of people's opinions because of a certain uh, right and character rather than Snake as the main character. MGS2 had a 95.09. Wow. What was MGS3? Uh, not in the top four. What? All right, number two. That's oh, I just I shouldn't have told you that. Or do you? If you don't get it, do you not go to additional ones? Is that how you want to do it? I, I don't like, want you to only game. keep going. We we'll yeah, keep going because you know it's fun. Number two. Oh, you okay? I see. Uh, yeah. Second second game. Well, uh, M- MGS four. MGS one. All right, one point for Alex. MGS one. All right. All right, and then the third one. MGS four. Alex, um, I'm going with uh, Phantom Pain. 
It is MGS4. Okay. Oh, Tristan gets a point. Thank the Lord. All righty. Next series, we have Kirby. Oh, I knew oh, this no. was coming. This this had to come up. Obviously, right. it's Air Ride right as number one. Give me the best of the bunch. Return to Dreamland. I'm going with Kirby Superstar. You're both wrong. <laughs> oh, it's, it's Kirby's Epic Yarn. What? With 88. Wait, what? With Kirby. Okay, cancel this game. I'm done. Mm-hmm. That game was All trash. Right, number, number, number two. Oh, this is gonna rile Tristan up. Robobot. Nightmare in Dreamland. You're both wrong again. Oh my it's God. Canvas Curse. What? Okay, cancel this game. I'm done. No. <laughs> These games are trash. All right, do we want to go number three? Of we'll Kirby, of course. Three. Of Kirby, course. Kirby Air Ride. Tristan. Return to Dreamland. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stick with that. You're all wrong again. Oh it's Kirby Superstar with 86. What? All right, here we go. This one should be easier. I hope you at least get the number one. Call of Duty. Call of Duty 4. Yeah, I'm going with Call of Duty 4 as well. One point for each of you. Number two. You guys think of number two? Modern Warfare 3. Blops 2. Is Modern Warfare 2. <sighs> people didn't like Modern Warfare 3, Tristan. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, that one people didn't like too much. All right, and then our third one. Blops one. Ghosts. <laughs> OG Call of Duty. Oh. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. It got like a billion awards when it came out. And I'll give you those scores real quick. So Modern Warfare 2 was a 94. Or Modern Warfare was a 94. Modern Warfare 2 was a 93. And the original was a 91. All right. I don't know. This one's going to be hard. I don't know if we want to do this one. But we're going to do it. Pokemon. Oh, man. Is this counting spinoffs? Yes. Oh boy. Oh, well, I, I think I think we can eliminate the Coliseum games. Those are probably not in there. Neither is Battle Revolution. All right, just give it. Throw it out there. Throw it out there. We gotta. These gotta be quick. Are you counting like Crystal and like Gold and Silver to be all separate games? They're. I. That's that's why I was thinking about like. How to do this one or skipping this one? Mm -hmm. It's um, almost impossible to guess the right game. Uh, All right, we'll do gold. combo. We'll do gold. combo. We'll do combo. Gold. I'm going with. Uh, I'll say. Uh, oh God, well, X and Y. It was gold and silver. Oh, silver, silver specifically with a ninety-one. You should have said right. silver. Yeah, I number, one point for Tristan. All right, number two. You're never gonna get this. Just say something, please. <laughs> Puzzle League. Oh my god! <laughs> Stadium. Oh, it was Puzzle Challenge. No! <laughs> Puzzle Challenge with a 90.2. Rip. And then number three. Uh, I'll go with red, blue, yellow. I'll go with fire red, leaf green. It was. It was blue version. So you guys are tied at three again. All right, next one. This one's sad, but we'll do it. Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, no. What's the best of the bunch, guys? I need answers. Mm, I want to say a newer game, but I almost feel it's going to be one of the older games. Remember uh, what I said about the, the yeah, bias? I know. I know. I'm thinking about it. Well, it's probably not going to be Sonic Spinball, so... Uh... You know what? I'm going uh, Sonic 3. Sonic right, 2. Tristan. The correct answer with an 89.00 is Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Yes. One point for Alex. All right, number two. Oh, man. What would come after? Sonic Mania. What? What? <laughs> Didn't look up what the game is. Hopefully, oh, okay. Hopefully it's, it's not, not that weird of a game. Hopefully it's not Sonic Forces. Uh, I'm going with uh, Sonic Unleashed. Sonic CD. Oh, okay. Mm. Sonic and Boom. And this was 88.57, so just a little below 89.00. And then number three. I'm going to stick with it. Sonic Mania. Sonic Adventure 2. 
It was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 with 88.44. Number 4 was Sonic Mania Ah. with 87. Old game inflation. All right, our score is 4-3, one in favor of Alex. Next series, Final Fantasy. Oh, God. Does this also count all the spinoffs? Uh... Yes, but I will say right now that none of the spinoffs are on this list, and it's only mainline games. Fantastic. Seven. Seven is probably the first one. Eh. It is Final Fantasy three with ninety three point three six. Wait, Wait, is that OG is that, three or is six? That, is that US three or JP three? I don't know. Neither of you said six or three though. So okay. No, no. I need to uh, know. No, we, I need, we to, need know. to know which one's which. Like, is it actually talking about six, or is it talking about three? All right, I'll spoil in this and say six was number four, so it's neither going to be six. So six isn't going to be any of these. Okay, so it's really? three. Okay, so Final Fantasy three. By the way, the score difference between the first and the fourth is 1.2 points. <laughs> so... And, and what did this game get? 93.36. So number two. Four. Uh, I'm going to stay stick with seven. Both wrong again. It is Final Fantasy Nine. Oh my god. Ninety was that a good one? I never played that one. Yeah, people love any... that one. Okay, ninety two point seven two. And then our third. Stay strong, guys. Stay strong, Alex. No. That's my hint. No. What the hell? That's cheating. Ricky Dicky. Uh what if I'm baiting you? Yeah, what if it's actually Final Fantasy ten? X two. I feel obliged to give you guys hints because you guys are getting any of these. <laughs> what was it? What was it? Really hard. It was Final it. Fantasy VII. No! Okay. What? Baited. Counter baited. That's okay. No one got it. Even points. Next series Assassin's Creed. Two. Yeah, I'll go with Brotherhood. It is two. Yeah. Oh, man. I was All thinking right, people number two. Would like and that was a 90.71. Alright, next one. Assassin's Creed 1. Are you... Really? <laughs> really? That was so three, bad. 3. Well, I mean, it was bad, but people liked it back then, so there wasn't anything to compare it to. You guys uh, keep forgetting what you guys said in your previous answer. It's Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. All right. And our third game. I gotta stick with 3. Alex? I'll be a trendsetter and say 4. It is 4. What? Black flag. Dang Alex it. getting 2. 3 was number Man. 4. I'll give you the scores. Okay, I'll give you the scores next time. I'll say the score of the game. People love um, pirates. So we have the uh, Black Flag was 87.62 and 3 was 85.56. Alright, next series. Resident Evil. Our top game had a score of 95.85. Resi 4. Resi 4. You're both correct. Um, our next game. Alright, next game. Resident Evil. This one had a 93.79. 7. Re- Resi 2. Resident Evil Code Veronica. Oh, I, I was going to guess Code Veronica at some point. Damn. I didn't think it'd be number, number 2, though. Number 3 with a 93.13. So just a little below our last one. 7. 0. It was Resident Evil 2. <laughs> Man, oh, you guys keep forgetting I, about I should, the games that you say. <laughs> I should just have stuck strong, them. but for I think the third time in a row, the fourth game was Resi 7. Oh my god. <laughs> um. If I was doing fourth games, Tristan would be the winner, I think, mm-hmm. right now. Um, but we're moving on to our next franchise. Uh, we have The Legend of Zelda. Ocarina? Breath of the Wild. With a 97.54, it is Ocarina of Time. Oh man. The power of no reviews. Number two, with a score of 97.4. Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild again. All right, you guys both got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what is our third game? With a score of 95.0. Wind Majora's. Waker. Both wrong. Twilight Princess. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I like Twilight Princess, but okay. I liked, I liked your huh. Mm-hmm. Huh? Huh? Right, we're tied up right now at 8-8, eight, eight. and this is the, our top three games in this category are split by 0. 
They're all in 97. Oh my god. And the god. category is Mario. What? Mario. So the top score is 97.64. The second highest is 97.42. And the third highest is 97.35. Good luck, gentlemen. Galaxy 2. Alex? Mario 64. You're both incorrect. The top was Galaxy 1. Hmm. Number 2. Galaxy 2. 64. You're both wrong. The next was Odyssey. The third one. Galaxy 2. 64. It was Super Mario Galaxy 2. (laughs) Number 4 was Super Mario 64. Dropping out of the 97 club with a 96.41. Tristan Jung, you have won this week's longer than expected running game um, with a score of 9 to 8. Congratulations. I'll take the belt. Hand it over here. I'll take the belt. You already had the belt. Well, here you go, Albert. Hand it back to me. (laughs) All right, all right. Here you go, Tristan. Here's your belt, man. Thank you. Congratulations on the two time viewport relay game champion of the episode award do i get to put in a plug uh no okay no you don't do you want to put in a plug sure i just want to say to all the listeners please check out captain toad treasure tracker dropping this friday no no we're cutting the feed we're cutting the feed cut the feed cut the feed all right everyone that wraps it up for episode seven of viewport relay Viewport Relay is available on Radio Public, iTunes, Google Music, Stitcher, Podbean, and all your favorite podcast directories. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, review, and share it with your friends. We're also on social media as Viewport Gaming on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. But the real question is, Tristan, why Viewport Gaming? Viewport Relay is part of Viewport Gaming, a website that provides a look into video games through reviews, features, and podcasts. You can find all of Viewport content at viewportgaming.com. All right, thanks, Tristan. And as always, I've been your host, Albert Corston, and I've been joined by Alex Nestor. See ya! And Tristan John. Do-do-do-do! We'll see you next time! Thank you.